All right, guys, so I literally just figured out how I can zoom in and out with this thing. Uh, again, I'm not good with cameras, so. Anyway, guys, this is a 4G63 that's been machined and it's uh, got back to me from the machine shop. Um, so, the major things that happen when an engine goes to the machine shop. First and foremost, you send your pistons, your crankshaft, and your connecting rods to the machine shop. You also send the girdle and the main bolts or studs that you're going to be using. In our case, we use studs, so we use the ARP 2000 main studs. And also, a torque plate with the gasket that you're going to be using with the head studs that you're going to be using. So this is an RB900 uh, engine package. This is Alex's engine that we're assembling right now. This is also going to get paired with one of my race port heads with the O-rings and everything that I mentioned earlier. Um, so I'm going to turn this around for you guys real quickly so we can talk a little bit more about it. As you guys can see, there's a lot of oil. The reason there's a lot of oil is because I just uh, washed the boards with ATF automatic transmission fluid uh, and I pressure washed the block, you know, got uh, one of these, uh, I don't know where it is, you know, the wire brushes that you use to basically clean out oil galleys. So all these return backs, you want to make sure there's no, you know, middle chips or something like that from the machining process actually stuck in there. So I hit it a few times with that and then uh, Basically, we pressure wash the block, dry it off as fast as we can, and then we apply oil on the machine surfaces so they don't rust. So there's very obvious reasons. You get head gasket seats, this sits here. Uh, we always shoot for a super, super smooth RA, you know, uh, under 30, usually, usually under 25 RA most of the time. Um, and sometimes even smoother than that. So the smoother it is, the better the MLS gasket's gonna seal. Um, on top of that, the reason that I actually ATF the block, again, this is something that I actually talked about in one of Josh's videos, or many videos actually. The reason I use the ATF is because it has some detergents in it, and um, when we actually clean the cylinder bores, there are actually peaks and valleys here, more valleys than peaks, and I'll explain that in a little bit. So those valleys actually retain a lot of the, you know, the stone, uh, material when they use it to hone it now obviously the torque plate gets bolted onto here to simulate the cylinder head being bolted on top of the block we also have the girdle at the time that this is being machined and this is being done and this is mind you this is after the block gets bored so this is when you're honing it so the final few thousands when you're honing to achieve your desired piston to wall clearance the torque plate is bolted up using the same head gasket that you're going to be using when the engine is going to be running the same head stud that you're going to be using in your build. Again, put the girdle over there, torque the spec. So you're basically mimicking everything assembled. And the reason you do that is because whenever you install a torque plate on this, because of the fact that the actual stud doesn't protrude too deep into the block and is not even close to the main, so there's at least a six inch uh, gap between the mains and the, stud, the head studs, what happens is the torque plate or the cylinder head being up on top, it will actually pull and oval the cylinder. So what you're gonna have is you're gonna have a different size, different clearance on the top, in the middle, and all the way in the bottom of the cylinder. Now, that's obviously not good. Why is it not good? Because you're gonna have bad ring wear, you're not gonna have proper seal because the cylinder is gonna be oval and not round like it's supposed to so the rings aren't going to seal as, as well you're going to lose ring seal faster because of the same reason and of course the clearance which if you shoot for three and a half and up top it's two you know this is where it gets really hot so it's gonna be even smaller whenever the engine's operating super hard so you're gonna have a lot of wear you can you know you can get to a point that you butt the rings you can anneal the rings when they get insanely hot what will happen is the ring will actually start closing up and it'll just keep the shape so it won't basically tension back like it's supposed to so a ring is just a tensioning tool is what it is um, and obviously that's not good so when we torque plating we, we are assuring that it's gonna be dead on over here over here over here and all three axes so obviously when we do that we get the benefits of not getting skirt wear we're running the proper piston to wall um, we're not getting any uh, we're not losing any ring tension and we're not, 
you know, loading the rings um, unnecessarily. So the engine's just gonna last longer. It's the proper way of doing it. Some blocks will get away with not running a torque plate, and those are the blocks that will have the head stud uh, threads and the holes protrude all the way down close to the mains. The reason for that is um, it's not biting on top of the block. It's actually going deep. And if it goes deep, it doesn't distort it as much. You're still gonna have a little bit of distortion, but not as bad as you would on a 4G63 uh, or a 4B11. The 4B11 is a little bit better, but again, we always use the torque plates on every engine that we built. Now, I'm talking about almost a 2,000 difference that I've seen from top to bottom. That's a big, big difference. So if you're shooting for a three and a half and you have two over here, uh, you know, two and a half or one, one and a half, not one, but one and a half or something like that, and you have like five thou on the bottom, everything's just thrown off. So you guys can see where I'm going with this. Use a torque plate. I always tell everybody this, use a torque plate. Um, and the way this is gonna work is the machinist is gonna actually measure the piston skirt right about here. Usually the manufacturer will give you a point to measure from. Uh, they'll zero out their dial bore gauge, they'll stick it in there, you know, and then they'll start final honing, checking it every, you know, couple strokes to, you know, see if they're coming close to the desired clearance. And you usually want to be within uh, a tenth or two tenths of a thou uh, from your target goal, basically, your final goal. So over here is the girdle. The 4G63 has a one piece girdle. Two bolt mains, however, it, this all ties into the block. So this is why the 4G63 is insanely strong. Uh, this is why, you know, people can make 1,000, 1,100 horsepower on the, you know, just the regular block without doing anything crazy to it, really. We use the ARP 2000 uh, mains. We torque them to a different spec than what ARP recommends, but we don't get the yield point. So this is something that I've actually incorporated over the years. You know, talking to some good friend machinists that I have and stuff, that they've tried this as well. Uh, and I use it on my builds and it works fantastic because we go a little bit higher on the torque, but at the same time, this is getting a line, a line board and a line honed. So we hit all of this. So we close up, we basically make it an oval. And then they go in there and they align hone it. So the, we're basically just aligning all of the mains. So you definitely need to do this whenever you use main studs because it's gonna it's gonna oval your mains and you want to have it as round as possible. Obviously for obvious reasons, you know the journal's round, so you don't want to put a round journal in an oval housing. Um, the crankshaft gets zero balanced. So this crankshaft, it's an internally balanced engine. It's a four cylinder, so you don't have to put bob weights on it to balance it so you, you zero it out to the crankshaft itself so they put it on the balancer and you know they'll drill a couple holes or sometimes you need to add weight so they'll add metals like mallory you know something super heavy and super expensive you know they're very expensive usually you can just take a little bit of material off and you know they're pretty much good to go this is a stock 4g63 crankshaft this is an evo 9 block so this came out of an evo 9 um obviously the 8 and 9 they're the, the same crankshafts and then we have a new shipment of king bearings but i have a crap ton over there this place is a mess right now guys so i apologize but this is the only these are the only bearings that i use so i'm going to show you guys in a little bit when i unbox this because this is my new shipment of the pmax coats uh i always get two sets for every engine just in case and i always get an extra clearance set usually usually i don't have to use it because they're so dead on and the machine work is so dead on that I don't have to make many adjustments, which saves me time, saves me labor, so I can do one engine and get to the next or do whatever else I'm, I'm doing. These are the custom diamond pistons, the same stuff that we were using at JRP. The only differences are, now we actually have horizontal gas ports, so more dynamic compression, so less blow by, thanks to this modification. And we obviously still have the I don't know if I can focus. We still have the horizontal gas port. So we have verticals and horizontals. Um, on top of that, it's a full skirt, as you guys can see. So this this is just really strong because the you know you're not stressing this pin boss area. Um, it adds a couple grams, I think it's like five grams, that's really not that much over the what I call a half skirt design, which is not half skirt, it's just it doesn't have this full piece. It, it's just a little bit narrower over here. And then obviously we still have the uh, dry loop coating. 
However, now every single RB spec piston that you guys get will have these 1.2 millimeter AP top steel ring. So this is a proprietary ring that Total Steel offers. This does not anneal as easily. It has a little bit more drag on the cylinder compared to the conventional 1.0 NPR ring pack that basically every manufacturer offers. There's nothing wrong with that. However, this is just an upgrade that I do on every single engine that I build. Uh, these rings are also a lot harder to file. They're just a harder material. I just find this a lot better to use on a high boost application. Um, pins, 225 thou, H13 tool steel pins. Very strong pins. I mean, you literally everything else will break before this pin breaks. And of course, we got the Kelly's Ultra Enforcer 156 millimeter because this is a long rod setup. 156 millimeter I beam connecting rods with the ARP 18M 7/16 diameter rod bolts. If I can get this thing to focus, of course. I don't know if you guys can see that, but anyway, these are 716 bolts. So I use both these and uh, the Carillos. The Carillos are a little bit more expensive. They're lighter. They'll get the job done. I mean, we've pushed motors over a thousand wheel horsepower, steel rod motors on the uh, Carillo stuff. Uh, and these are just overkill in my opinion, but they're great rods. So I use them. Some of the tools, but not all of them are going to be here. So let me just do this real quick. So this is obviously a rod bolt stretch gauge because we don't just rely on the torque number that the manufacturer gives us and torque it to that and just uh, you know call it a day. We actually use the stretch gauge to make sure that the bolt is stretching to the proper uh, specification. If you go too much on the stretch, you're gonna reach its yield point and it's not gonna spring back like it needs to because this, this bolt is like a spring. Um, if you go too little, obviously you're not gonna have enough clamp on it. So this gets stretched at the machine shop to make sure that this housing is perfectly round. Um, and we do the same thing here whenever we put our bearings in there and we're trying to check for clearance and we want whenever we assemble it. Beautiful four piston um, um, deck, deck, uh, piston to deck measuring tool. I forgot the actual name for this. So this is basically to figure out how much your piston is sticking out or how much under it is uh, relative to the deck height. So this is important when you're trying to, you know, use different head gaskets and you're trying to factor in compression ratio and all that stuff. Um, one of the most important tools, which is going to be a piston ring spreading tool. So this is just going to and this is just an installer so this opens the ring and you can slide it onto the piston this avoids you having to bend the ring and walk it on there every time you walk a ring on there chances are you're bending that ring and it's never going to go back to its original shape and you obviously i don't have to explain why that's a bad thing so got a couple diamond burrs over here so this is what a jeweler would use for you know di you know i guess diamonds i don't know that's what it's called but we use this for every time I grind the ring on my electronic ring grinder, I will use this to take all the sharp edges off. So it doesn't catch inside the groove, which is bad, obviously. So if it has a little step, it's not gonna rotate freely. It's gonna give you a lot of problems. And obviously you don't wanna scuff the cylinder. If you scuff the cylinder, Again, you're scratching up the cylinder, so you're, the ring's gonna wear. It, you know, it, start, it starts to rotate around. It can actually get stuck and not rotate around, and it can cause all kinds of issues, micro welding, blow by, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. So we make sure that it's perfectly, you know, it's not round or it's not like at a 45 degree, but we make sure all the edges are taken off. So you, we don't go crazy with this, but this is something that definitely has to be done. Another thing I wanted to mention that I almost never see anybody do is every time you get a piston coated like this, the skirts get blasted. This gets taped up and they spray this coating on. Now, I don't know how well you guys can see this. Let me see. But if you guys, I don't know if you guys can see this, but if you don't, just take my word for it. There's a little bit of overspray and this overspray is a little bit rough. So my concern with this has always been, what if it comes off? So what I do is I'll take a little bit of emery, emery cloth or steel wool or even some scotch bite. Obviously you have to make sure you get all the, you know, all the foreign material off before you install this. So this has to get, you know, break clean over and over and over again to make sure there's nothing in there and blown off with air. But basically all that gets taken off 
uh, you know, the excess obviously, not the actual coating, and that so it doesn't break apart and end up in your oil pan and ultimately in your oil galleys and under your bearings. That would be a disaster. Same thing over here. If you look over here around the actual area where the skirt ends, there's a little bit of overspray. So I just I just go over that. Also, anytime, anytime you do a long rod on a 4G63, you're gonna have an oil support rail. So this is gonna be a rail that gets installed underneath the three oil control rings, or this is a this is a one-pack ring, as most like to call it. So that rail just supports it because of the fact that the pin has been moved up. So that's just a support rail for the actual pin and the actual oil rings, oil control rings, I should say. So if you guys can see, again, it's one of those crazy things that I don't know if I can even point it out. I know I keep moving the camera. Bear with me, guys. I'll get better at this as we go. There's a little step over here from the machining process. This also has to get knocked down every single time. That's where this thing comes in. It's not as fine as this, but it's perfect for knocking off that little bit of aluminum. I don't know if you guys can see this. Well, probably not, but right here is what I'm talking about. There's a little bit of an edge. Most people won't even notice that, but obviously I do. Micrometers. We have to take a lot of measurements. This is for the pistons. So this is for me to basically zero out my measurement from my dial bore gauge to the piston skirt and then measure the piston to wall clearance. Again, with the torque plate being attached. Now, one more thing uh, that I wanna talk about, guys. Some people, Jay from Real Street actually talked about this as well. And I respect the guy a lot. You know, he's a very, very knowledgeable person, a lot more knowledge than me, that's for sure. Um, and um, the topic is, do you use a torque plate when you're gapping your rings? The answer is you can. Do you need to? Not necessarily. You're probably gonna have half to, you know, one uh, thou of, you know, variation if you don't use the torque plate. So. We already got the rings sort of on the looser side, a lot tighter than most engines have taken apart because, um, you know, too tight and everybody's gonna know, a little loose, nobody's gonna know. Uh, but if you go too loose, obviously you're gonna have blow by and you know, that's also not proper. Um, as far as checking the end gaps for the oil control rings, every manufacturer will have a specification for it. All you do is you just put it in the bore, square it up which I have the four piston squaring tool, which I love, and I'll show you guys when I'm assembling it. And you just make sure it has the proper adequate clearance. If it doesn't, you probably have the wrong ring pack. You don't modify that. You don't grind it, you don't do anything. It's always gonna be what they recommend or slightly more, so, uh, or what they specify it as. So, what we're gonna do right now, like I said, after we've done all this, so we've, we've uh, torque plated the block. We've honed it out to our desired piston to wall. We've trued up the mains with the ARP main studs. Um, we've obviously decked the block. So we take about, you know, two or three thousandths or whatever we need to take off. Usually not more than two or three thousandths because the head, you know, the block doesn't have warpage. Uh, if it does, then you take more off obviously, but you don't want to take too much off because then again, it throws all the measurements off and you know, your compression ratio is varied and all that stuff. So, and obviously the deck height, this is where the head gasket bites onto. So if you don't have enough material here or the cylinder head or both, then you're more likely to lift the head or flex a lot of stuff and you know, have a head gasket failure, or, you know, crack the block or whatever the case may be. So, uh, this block is plateau honed. What plateau honing is, is the last honing stone, the couple last honing stones that are used are super, super fine. And what that does is it allows all of the peaks to kind of get knocked off. And you have the valley. So obviously you need the valleys in there to retain the oil. You know, that's why you have a cross hatch or else it would be a perfectly smooth cylinder. Those valleys actually retain oil. However, the peaks, or what the ring had to knock down in the old days, that's why they did a long break-in procedure before they put a lot of power to it because when the ring is actually operating and it's doing all that hard work, it's getting super hot, okay? So it's obviously, there's a lot of friction because it's knocking down those peaks, right? And you'll hear this term RPK, you know, all that stuff with, when the machinist measures this with a profilometer, I can't, for the sake of God, I can't pronounce that word ever. But that's basically what measures the peaks and valleys and the heights of basically the highest and the lowest points 
Uh, but basically, the ring had to do all that work, and on top of that, if you were trying to put a lot of power on top of that, they were heating up the ring like an insane amount. So that's why they would do a long raking procedure. With the Plateau Hone motors, it only takes a couple seconds, I should say. I mean, uh, really a couple minutes, but the first couple seconds that the engine's running, with I should say I really should say within a couple minutes everything is already knocked off and the rings are ready to basically take power now if you induce boost and again gas ports right so your dynamic compression when you induce dynamic compression it also pushes on the ring pushes it out and it knocks all those off so with a plateau hone motor we don't do a 2,000 3,000 mile break in 1,000 mile break in it just gets an oil change with uh, braking oil, maybe a 30 weight, 40 weight, whatever the case may be. And then we put 2050 because that's the viscosity I use for the bearing clearances that I use, respective to that. <coughs> Excuse me. And based on that, uh, after, after we do that oil change and the filter change, we're kind of getting all the gunk out, you know, all the uh, high pressure lube, all the molly lube, all that stuff that's in there. Um, and we're pretty much ready for the dyno. So what I'll do usually is I'll put it, the car on the dyno. And again, this is a different video, but uh, I'm just gonna get into it really quickly, really briefly. Put it on the dyno, you know, induce a little bit of load, maybe five to 10 pounds of boost. Just hold it there for a couple of seconds. Steady state dyno, obviously. And then kind of back it down, let it cool down. Do it again a couple times, increase the boost as we go. Maybe for like 10, 15 minutes. Drain the oil, new filter, throw as much power at it as the customer wants or you know whatever we're capable of it's never failed me it's always like five to eight percent leak down through the rings which again guys this is a built motor so you're gonna have some leak down through the rings because it's built a little bit looser because it's a 2618 alloy it's not a cast piston but anyway that's the gist of it so now what i'm gonna do next is i'm gonna bring the bearings out i'm gonna show you guys the bearings I'm going to show you guys what I look for on the bearings, what adjustments I make on the bearings before I even install it and look for the clearance and the check for the clearance. And then obviously when all that clearance stuff is checked, then we're going to install the crank. So you guys are going to be with me every step of the way and we're going to build a 4G63. So see you guys in a couple minutes. All right, guys. So this is one of the reasons why we check every bearing out of the box. I don't know if you guys can see what I'm trying to point out, but right over here there's a little bit of overspray so we got to take care of that so i'll try to knock it off with a little uh special pick that i have and if it doesn't work then we're just going to unbox another bearing set and we're going to get another one um that's usually easily knocked off but this is why we check every single bearing that and there's usually overspray on these little um relief grooves for the oil pressure basically the oil to come in and uh, also over here, sometimes it's rough. Right now it's not, but sometimes there's a rough uh, finish to it and I'll take a quadruple zero steel wool and I'll hit it once very lightly. So I'm not taking any other coating off. I'm just taking the overspray off. Very important guys, very important. All right guys, so real quickly, these two are the same exact bearings. Okay, so they're both by King Racing, King Racing bearings. They're both the P-Max coat, so they both have the polyanonymer coating on there. So it's essentially like a four layer bearing. However, this one is the one that I modify before it goes into the engine, and this is the one that comes from the box. Now, you'll notice something. The one on the left, the one that I said I quote unquote modified, is a little bit more dull compared to this one. This one has a darker color. If you could feel this, obviously you can't, but I'm gonna give you a little demonstration. I can feel some overspray over here, okay? And on the edges. So, and on top of that, what I do is I, I'll, I'll look over here on the tang. Sometimes there's overspray here that builds up. So that's obviously not good and has to get taken care of because if that breaks up when the engine's running, that's gonna grab a bearing or it's gonna significantly significantly reduce the life of your bearing if it doesn't grab the bearing which it usually will if it's a big piece and sometimes there's big pieces on there so you gotta double check again this one has been hit with a quadruple zero steel wool 
very slightly, maybe two passes. So this is literally not even taking any material off. You're just taking the overspray off of it. Um, and obviously the sides as well. So when the crank rides on this, none of this breaks up and goes in, inside your engine. On the freshly built engine, you don't want to have these you know little pieces floating in your oiling system and scuffing up your crankshaft, your actual bearings and shortening the life. It's these little things that consume a lot of time, but in the end, basically give you something that's, you know, uh, not something you can buy off the shelf, is pretty much what I'm trying to say. These little tactics, these little things that every machinist or every engine builder, you know, has their own way of doing it, but, you know, I don't mind sharing this knowledge with you guys, the people that are trying to do DIY. The bear, these, these are one of the most important things that you're putting in your engine. Essentially, this is probably the most critical thing in your engine. So, you just gotta, you know, with some bearings, you don't have to do that because they don't have a coating on there. But you always want to look at the tangs. Whenever you put this in the engine as well, so, for instance, I have the I have the ones that go on the block, so the top ones. I've, I've done all that, and I also make sure the tang is not in a weird location because sometimes what will happen is the tang will be offset a little bit, or it will be a little bigger. And you know you can have a lot of issues with that. I mean you got to make sure you know all the bearings are seated and again like I said the reason I do the steel wool is to get rid of the overspray and it works flawlessly. Never had any issues with it. Bearings come out looking pretty much like that. Um, and yeah that's why I use the steel wool. So that's the difference between a uh, out of the box bearing and a bearing that's been carefully inspected. One or two very very light passes. I mean I don't even put pressure on it. Passes with the steel wool, same thing on the sides, one quick little pass, very easy pass, and then it just gets cleaned and we're ready to check for clearance. Alright guys, so some quick measurements that have been taken. I have my uh, good son. Uh, crankshaft stand it's basically a v-block that allows me to check for a run out and stuff like that however for uh, the journal measuring purposes I just you know lay it flat and I'll use my micrometer I'll take five or six measurements of each journal and kind of get an average and kind of figure out what the actual journal size is and that's what I've done over here and we have about a two tenths of a thousandths variation uh, so what that means is the biggest journal to, to compared to the smallest journal there's two tenths of a thousandth variation which isn't a lot and this is kind of common to see on uh, used crankshafts uh, especially uh, when you polish them a little bit um, you know sometimes you do take that one tenth of a thou off but this is what we need to factor in when we're actually measuring our bearing clearance so I've actually taken the fattest journal so the widest journal uh, which is at two inches, uh, 243 thousandths and four ten thousandths of an inch. And I am going to put this on my micrometer vise. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to get my dial bore gauge and I'm going to zero out my dial bore gauge to this measurement, which is essentially the biggest journal that we have on the crankshaft. Once I do that and zero out my dial bore gauge and make sure it is absolutely zeroed, what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure all of the main bearing clearances. So these already have the top and bottom shells installed. The ARP 2000 main studs all torqued to spec in the sequence that they needed to be torqued at. A uh, three stage torquing sequence. And now we're going to check for our bearing clearances. Now keep in mind that I have that set at the biggest journal so I have to keep that in mind whenever I'm taking the measurements because I might have to subtract or add a little bit to whichever main that I'm measuring. So that's kind of what I'm going to show you guys. It's, it's very simple. Uh, once I show you guys, you guys will get it. <laughs> Alright guys, so this is going to be extremely hard to do with one hand. Fortunately, I don't have a tripod for this yet. So I'm going to try to show you guys the best I can. What I'm trying to achieve here, it's probably not going to work. So, we are basically, <laughs> basically, I'm, I'm just going to tell you guys what I'm doing, because um, I don't think I can film it, but basically what I'm doing is, like I mentioned in the last portion of the video, I have this zeroed out to the, well, I have this 
to the measurement of the biggest journal on the crankshaft. And I have this now zeroed out, the style bore gauge, to the measurement of the biggest journal. So if this comes to zero, that means the measurement is exactly the size of the journal. Obviously, we're not gonna have that. We're gonna have some clearance for the bearing. So I think I'm just gonna do this, uh, double check it again, because I keep on moving this around, make sure it's where it needs to be. And then I'm gonna show you guys how to actually check the bearing, bearing clearances, and that's gonna be a little bit easier to film. So see you guys in a second. All right, guys, hopefully this is gonna be slightly easier to film now. Should have got a helping hand here but since we don't have that basically you insert the dial bore gauge right there and we check for clearance and as you guys can see I don't know if you guys can see it a little bit on the looser side that's a little bit above three so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna swap shells on this one now I have to do this for every single bearing basically so all five of the mains so once i get this done i'm gonna uh, continue the video and explain to you guys what i had to do to get the desired clearance right now we're about 3.3 uh thou so three thou and three tenths of a thou uh that's kind of on the looser side ideally i want to keep it you know around the two and a half range for the power level that this engine is going to be seeing if this was a dry sum motor that this wouldn't be an issue but it's not, it's using a Mitsubishi oil pump. So, you know, there are certain clearances that we follow and use for specific engines that we built. So I'll be back. All right, guys. So now the block is actually on the floor. Um, the last two mains are impossible to measure with uh, even the Smith Toyo um, dial bore gauge. So you need something like a Sunnen the 12 inch one um, or the 24 inch one which uh, I will be getting very soon I don't know why I just haven't made that purchase yet I do this like every time so basically what you have to do is you have to take it off the stand if you don't have that gauge and you measure the other two vertically like this so this is going to be a little bit easier to show so all of the other four mains except for number one are where they need to be exactly where they need to be uh, as far as clearance goes. So I'm just gonna give you guys a little demonstration on number four. As you guys can see, it's dead on at two and a half. Two, two and a half to 2.6 tenths of a thou. There we go. So, all the other ones are within a tenth of a thousandth of that, and that's perfectly fine with me. What this means is we gotta take the girdle off, and we gotta Measure the thickness of the bearing, and I have to open one or two other bearing packs. Measure the thickness and choose a thicker bearing. Uh, and the thicker bearing will go on the bottom side because this is the portion that sees the most load because obviously gravity and the crankshaft's riding on this. So the thicker one will go over here. So all I have to do is find the thicker shell, put it on number one, torque it down, measure everything again, make sure it's all the same, and then take it off, put the thrust bearings in there, assembly lube, clean everything, assembly lube, drop the crankshaft in there. After the crankshaft gets pressure washed and um, you know we um, put one of those, uh, you know, uh, I forgot what they're called, the wire brushes through all the oil ports on the crankshaft and make sure it's super, super clean. Um, again, pressure wash it, blow it off, install it, and then torque it down again. All right guys, so I was talking to myself for five minutes here. Um, I basically just uh, measured the thrust clearance, right at seven and a half. You really don't wanna be under five, you don't wanna be over like 12, it's kind of excessive. That's gonna really depend on the thrust collar and the actual thrust bearing thickness itself. Uh, there's only one specific, there's only one size, however, there's gonna be a little bit of variance from you know one set to the next. Um, and obviously the thrust uh, flange on the crankshaft if it's damaged or whatever the case may be you know if you have too much wear that could also be the uh, issue and of course the flange on the block as well so this is exactly where we need it to be so everything's clearance crank spins like a dream um, and what I like to do is I like to bang on this uh, counterweight here and this counterweight 
just to seat the thrust bearing before I even spin the crankshaft. Uh, this is just kind of a habit that I've formed over the years. Um, but other than that, checked all the mains. I had to swap two shells over here to get the desired clearance that I wanted. Um, so the crankshaft's in there. Um, now what we got to do is measure the rod journals um, and clearance our rod bearings and our Kelly's uh, 156 millimeters ultra enforcer I beams. And then after that, we're going to prep the pistons for assembly and show you that process. So, see you guys. All right, guys. So we're at the point that I'm getting ready to check the rod bearing clearances. So this will follow the same procedure as the main bearing clearances so basically what I have to do is mic the rod journals now you can do this on the bench or the V blocks or you can just do it when it's in the engine I usually do it when it's in the engine if I don't have a V block set up which I didn't for this engine um, once we get that again it's the same procedure so what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the bearings in there obviously we're gonna clean the bearing backs so we're gonna make sure there's nothing on the surface of the bearing which again these coated bearings there is so again a little bit of steel wool maybe two passes it doesn't even take the coating off like i said it's the overspray that i'm worried about and uh, i only do it when you can feel it and on most of the sets you can actually feel the overspray and i don't want the uh, the oil to basically wash that off and that getting into the oiling system so i'm trying to keep everything as clean as possible during assembly um, some of it is going to be inevitable you're going to get some stuff in the engine, some foreign uh, material contaminants, it's going to end up naturally in the engine, but um, as long as it's something that you can prevent, so if it's like a big overspray, like uh, these two, like I don't know if it'll focus in, but right there is a little slight hump, maybe half, half, half of a thousandths high. I mean, this one, there was a little overspray over here that's a little high I didn't like these so I just these are brand new bearings I just didn't use them so this is why you always want to get a couple sets just to make sure especially with the coated bearings guys um, so the stuff that you can prevent from happening always prevent them from happening so check them check the bearing backs make sure there's nothing weird on the back of the bearing make sure there's nothing weird on the surface of the bearing obviously this is gonna you know right on the surface of oil and essentially the crankshaft but if you have something that's high enough it'll touch the crankshaft and there you go you have wear on the first startup or even when you're spinning the motor um, so obviously these are going to get torqued down torqued to spec and stretched and after we do that we can actually check our clearance again relative to our zero point um, on the micrometer you guys will notice something here the cheeks of the rods the big ends so the cheek Every engine that I assemble will take a little bit of material off of, of, off of brand new rods. The reason we do this is for rod side clearance and that's essentially when the cheek of the connecting rod big end um, is on the flange of the crankshaft over here. So this clearance between the two. Usually when you get a brand new crankshaft and you have brand new rods, you definitely need to do this on a used crankshaft such as this one that's been in service. Um, it's a little it's a little bit looser but usually not loose enough to my specification so if you even if you look on the factory service manual you'll have a minimum and a maximum and usually you'll get the minimum uh, with these rods without doing that modification now this is something that 90 percent 95 percent of the engines that i tear apart i don't see it being done but that five percent is usually from reputable builders and you know tuner shops that the engines uh, basically come from so uh, we do that to have adequate clearance um, and the oil is going to basically dispense from the sides the oil that gets wedged in here so the hydrodynamic wedge that you're going to have between the crankshaft and the actual bearing um, very important to check you want it to be above six thou but not really more than like 10 or 12 thou because at that point then you're going to you know drop oil pressure if it's too excessive um, and if it's too tight obviously you guys know the consequences you know they expand but they expand at different rates um, this is a cast crankshaft these are forged rods so the um, the expansion rate is going to be different so you know if you have like two or three thousands and there's barely any wiggle, wiggle room and you're running a fuel such as pump gas that induces more heat into the bottom end unlike the 85 you know you can actually grab that bearing and actually grab the rod and you know you can have a catastrophic failure so this is why i do this on every single motor now 
we do this before we even send these out to the machine shop. So when they balance these, they will balance the crankshaft. Like I said, they will zero out the crankshaft. So they'll zero balance the crank. So the crank is balanced on its own. The connecting rods will get balanced at a lightest connecting rod. So some material will get taken off either from here or sometimes from the tops, sometimes from these enforcer uh, enforcement uh, um, I don't know what you would actually call these, but these are basically enforcements for the you know cap. But if you take off a little bit of material, it's not going to hurt anything. If you're going to go ham, then th that's not the right way to do it. So you need to look into different ways of you know taking uh, material off to get your desired uh, weight. Now we balance these. We balance these. Uh, usually we don't touch the pistons. Usually it can be done with the rods because the pistons are aluminum, so you have to take a crap ton of material off to basically get it down a couple grams. So usually the rods will get balanced like that, and then we'll match the heaviest with the lightest. And you know we always always aim for about half a gram variation. Um, the reason the factory engine has balance shafts is because. The factory connecting rods are just mass produced and they're not essentially balanced to anything. So, you know, you have those uh, counter balance shafts and the balance shaft in there to, you know, obviously balance out the engine uh, and get less vibrations and all that bad stuff. And of course, if your balance is way off, then you can have uneven wear and um, it just depends on how far off it is. Usually, usually you can just take these out and assemble them, but obviously we go a step further we dynamically balance everything and make sure you know we're within half a gram of um piston to rod combo one to the next so that's pretty much it um king pmax coat bearings again again steel wool the reason i do this is because again there's use okay so first and foremost that overspray sometimes most of the time they're gonna have a little bit of overspray if you don't do this um and most people don't, and it's fine in their book, but not in my book. If you don't do this, uh, what has to happen is essentially that oil pressure will have to wash that overspray off. And that's just more contaminants that's going inside your engine. So you want to make sure you control as much uh, of the contaminants that's going into the engine. Some of it is going to be in in inevitable, obviously. Uh, some foreign contaminants are going to end up in there. But you want to make sure that the surfaces that are touching... You know, if, if, if there's a high point over here of like two thousandths, you know, it's going to touch the crankshaft or two and a half thousandths, it's going to touch the crankshaft and it's going to scuff it. So you want to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, so that's why I do the pass on the steel wool. These two bearings are from a brand new set as well. Another thing that the steel wool reveals is, again, just two light passes with no pressure on it. This will show me if there's any high spots or anything on the bearings and they both did. So this one had a high spot right there. Uh, if I can get it to focus, I can't, but uh, this one had a high spot right here. And these are high spots that you can feel with your finger. So if I can knock it off with my finger, I'm not going to take sandpaper to it and, you know, try to get it to basically uh, be flush. That's not the proper way of doing it because then the bearing is not going to be round when it gets crushed in the housing of the big end. So again, a couple things that you need to watch out for guys, the, you know, simple things, simple checks that I always do to make sure, you know, every engine is assembled as cleanly as possible. Um, these Cali's rods feature the 18M uh, spec ARP bolts, which are 7 16 inch in diameter, super overkill. These get uh, torqued to about 80 foot pounds and their recommended stretch is uh, five and a half thousandths to six and a half thousandths. Um, and the flanges are pretty much perfect on the cap side unlike the manly stuff that i used to use with the 625s the flanges aren't perfect so you have to go to crazy torque amounts sometimes to get them to stretch properly so with these you don't have to worry about uh, and same thing with the Carrillo stuff the Carrillo stuff is the quality control is so amazing on those that you don't even need to reapply any lube. You can literally use the lube that comes from the factory that's on the bolts. I always obviously wash them off, but you can literally use the same lube and it'll stretch to your spec. Um, now, if it doesn't stretch to your spec, obviously there, there could be a couple things wrong. Um, one could be the actual fastener. One could be the threads of the connecting rod, so the threads that are here. So that's why I have a super high quality tap. I paid about 200 bucks, I believe, for the tap. And uh, sometimes when I can't get a bolt to stretch, what I'll do is I'll take the rod off and I'll 
I'll run it through with that uh, with that precision uh, tap, basically. And when I do that, I'm ensuring that all the threads are clean. If there's any, you know, overhang of metal or whatever the case may be, uh, is completely clean. I'll brake clean it. I'll, you know, put some air to it, then I'll try to stretch it again. 99% of the time, it works. So again, just a couple of things that you guys need to watch out for. Um, so up next, I'm going to torque these up, and we're going to check. Uh, we're going to zero out our uh, dial bore gauge to our micrometer. So first, we got to take a measurement with the micrometer, and then we're going to zero it out, and then we're going to check our bearing clearances. All right, guys, the camera battery's dying, so I'm going to show you guys this quickly. So basically, now we have the bolts stretched and torqued the spec, zeroed out to the micrometer. That's zeroed out to this journal. They were all 1.7 inches, 712 and thousandths. So, I don't know if you guys can see right at two and a half. That's where we want it to be for this particular setup. I can get it to focus. Right there. So yeah. The rod bearings are now clearanced. Up next, uh, we're gonna address the skirt coating thing that I talked about. And then we're gonna get the rings, and we're gonna get everything ready to be made into their respective connecting rods. So the pistons and the pin and the rings, obviously, and all that stuff. And then we're gonna pretty much be ready to drop it in, guys. All right, what's going on, guys? So at this point, I have uh, the top compression and the bottom compression slash oil control ring um, for all four cylinders all filed so we filed them to specifications uh, they both have a different end gap sometimes people stagger them which is fine um, the reason I open up the gap a little bit more on the second ring is to uh, alleviate any you know um, any of the gases that gets trapped for it to easy uh, have an easier path to the crankcase uh, the reason I do this, so people might say, you know, this can cause blow by. You're gonna have blow by regardless, and that little bit that goes past the other ring that's, you know, 2000s bigger. Um, really, what I'm trying to achieve here is I'm trying to make sure the pressure doesn't get trapped between the two rings and causing ring flutter and micro welding, uh, which is a whole different topic that I actually did a tech talk on on my Instagram yesterday. Um, but uh, that's why I do that and then you also have to consider the top ring is always going to expand more than the bottom ring however they are different materials they like this one has a different coating on it and this one's a tool steel ring actually um, anyway so after you file fit the rings you take a diamonds burr so a jeweler's burr I should say and then you'll knock off all the edges all the sharp edges that are left after the grinding process so you want to do that so when you enter the ring inside the groove the respective groove in the actual piston it goes in and it moves around freely as you guys can see that's the side that's been filed and it moves around freely same thing with the non-filed side so I do it on both sides but very little you know you don't want to um, you know angle the edge of the ring you still want to have it perfectly squared and then anytime you grind the rings you want to make sure that when you butt the ends, they're perfectly straight. So that's how you know you're grinding them straight. So, you know, once you take a thousandths off, check it, do it again until you get comfortable. And then, of course, ATF. This, this uh, material that you guys are seeing that's coming off is from the coating of the second ring of one cylinder. So I usually go through like 10 or 15 of these towels for all four cylinders. All the rings get cleaned, including the oil control rings, those actually have some heavy rust inhibitors on there. So you want to clean all that foreign contaminant before you, you know, put it inside the engine. Uh, these are all things we do to make sure the rings rotate freely. The, re the way the ring actually rotates is with these cross hatches that you guys can see. So this obviously peaks and valleys, like I said, the valleys help to retain the oil and the cross hatch actually helps the, the rings turn. So you need to make sure they're turning freely and uh, the groove clearance isn't, you know, um, altered if you have any high spots or anything like that. So that's pretty much it. And then on the pistons, you know, I usually take uh, 
some emery cloth or something and I'll go over all these overspray portions especially on the sides over here because it can break and go inside your motor and scuff your cylinder wall and get in your you know um, oil passages and all that bad stuff um, and then of course this is a long rod so it has the oil control ring support rail because the pin is moved up so usually right over here you guys can't see it but right over here there'll be a little edge that you gotta go over with a little file so I have a super fine file over here that I knocked that off and of course you want to make sure you break clean the crap out of it and uh, you know blow it with some shop air to make sure that you know the little aluminum pieces don't get stuck on there so at this point we're ready to uh, undo the cap from the rod and what we're gonna do next is we're gonna assemble the piston rod combo put the rings on and then we're gonna get ready to drop them in now I use these tapered piston insulation sleeves uh, Ycycle sells them, ARP sells them, a bunch of companies sell them or you can make them if you really want to. So this is an 85.5 which is a 20 over bore so this is what I use usually as you guys can see the paint's faded on it uh, as opposed to, the, to all the other ones that I have that are pretty fresh so I use that the most. Uh, that ensures that you know you don't break a ring whenever you're installing it it's just a lot easier. Um, so yeah up next we're going to drop these in. All right guys, getting close to dropping it in, getting close to the exciting part. So everything's installed, piston, con rod, uh, wrist pin. So what I like to do is I like to take one of these snap ring pliers when I install the uh, wrist pin um, wire lock and put outward pressure on it and make sure it's completely seated. Uh, the last thing you want is for that thing to back off and your pin to float around and destroy your engine, so not fun. Another easy check that you should do uh, every time you put a lock in there um, and uh, yeah so pretty much what you want to have is you want to make sure that all the rings are spinning fine without any excessive drag on there or any drag whatsoever as you guys can see they're moving freely same thing with the oil uh, control rings uh, this one also has a oil support rail over here because of the, uh, the fact that the pins moved up um, and that has a dimple that will face down. Every manufacturer will have a different way of doing that, but usually you get the dimpled kind. Uh, sometimes there's actually a slot for it to basically go on and you don't need to worry about the dimple. What that dimple does is essentially it doesn't allow it to rotate. The bottom portion uh, of the, the oil, control, oil control ring support rail cannot rotate. However, all the other oil control rings have to rotate, so you got to make sure that they rotate. Um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, when I install these, the rings on there, I use a little bit of 30 weight conventional oil, so no additives, you know, uh, no detergents, nothing like that. It's just conventional oil. Again, this is going to help with the ring break in, uh, so seating the actual piston rings. Um, and uh, not a lot. I mean, if it's too much, I'll wipe a little bit off, but you know, just a little bit to basically get it on there and make sure there's a little bit of oil on it. Same thing with the oil control rings. Other than that, this is pretty much ready to get dropped into the cylinder so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the rings on number one two three and uh, once all of them are uh, basically in their positions I'm gonna drop it in so this is gonna be kind of hard again I'm alone here so well uh, you know sorry about that guys doing my best here but I'll be back alright guys so this beautiful RB900 short block is ready to get assembled and just cleaned out the boards, as you guys can see, perfectly clean crosshatch. So again, ATF a couple times over, make sure there's no contaminants. I do it until the towel that I use, I use these Chemtech um, special wipes, so they live very little lint. There's no such thing as lint free, so they leave very little lint. And then whatever's left, I just clean it with some brake cleaner and then uh, just blow it off with some shop air. So, up next, you guys are going to see me drop the last piston in, so I'm going to do one and four, and then two and three, so probably in number three, I'll show you guys the process of that. Alright guys, so number one, four, and number two are in. Uh, number one and four are already, the bolts are stretched and the cap's obviously on there. Number two is not because I'm dropping number three in and I always drop them in pairs. Um, so basically what you guys will notice is, 
we always have this chamfer over here and this is for the rings to basically be able to go inside the actual bore without getting stuck so if this was just straight and it didn't have a chamfer you would have a hard time putting the rings in without breaking them so I have my piston ring compressor over here 85.5 because this is a 20 over piston so what you want to do is you want to put a light coat of 30 weight oil well that's what I use uh, on the actual sleeve a little bit on the skirts uh, and as I told you guys with the rings, a slight amount on the rings as well, and then some assembly lube. So I always use the red line assembly lube, not the tacky stuff. Uh, I like these better. Most of these engines get ran within a month, month and a half anyway. So as you guys can see, the skirt's sticking out a little bit. So what this is going to allow me to do is, obviously the boards are cleaned again. So everything is just ready so as you guys can see the pistons actually fit in the cylinder right now so I can push this down with my finger um, you know it can be a little hard to do with one hand so what I like to do is grab a rubber mallet and that's it it's in the bore you can use the variable um, tool variable is in you know it adjust to size so you can basically use an allen wrench to size it up to your specific piston and the rings i don't like those i've broken a couple of rings with those before um uh, you know for my applications you know i use these almost every day so it, it makes sense for me to pay the 50 60 dollars and get the sleeve so what i'm gonna do right now is i'm gonna push this all the way down uh, i'm not gonna do it on camera because i want to make sure i'm getting it on the journal so i don't, I don't want to bang the bearing um and once that's in, I'm going to show you guys how we stretch the rod bolts. Alright guys, so I'm just going to show you guys on number four. Um, so this is how you check the rod bolt stretch. Basically, before I even get to this, I want to talk about something real quick. The Cali's Ultra I-Beams, they recommend the ARP Molly Lube, their high pressure lube. However, I use the CMD Extreme Pressure Lube for all the rod bolts. So... This allows the stretch to be uh, achieved a lot easier. Um, it cleans up the threads a little bit and it's just a better lubricant overall and it's a lot more tackier than the ARP stuff. So this is what I always use in the builds. Nothing wrong with it, a lot of uh, engine builders use it. It's just a preference thing. I think it's about 15 bucks a uh, tub and I got a couple of them. So anyway, so what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that the rod bolt is loose. Up next what you're gonna do is you're gonna put uh, this end and this end, this end is going to go to the head of the bolt and this other one has, there's a recess on the bottom portion of the rod bolt. So you're going to put this in here and then you're going to position it on the recess and you kind of want to wiggle it around to make sure it's actually seated and you zero it out. So I've already done that. So up next what I'm going to do is I'm going to torque this to spec which is 80 foot pounds. Now at 80 foot pounds we should achieve a minimum of a uh, five and a half thou stretch uh, to six and a half thou stretch anything more than that you kind of want to uh, you know maybe uh, lower the torque slightly but you want to be definitely in, in that range uh, depends on the power as well so if the car is making a lot of power you kind of be on the you kind of want to be on the higher side of the stretch uh, but if it's making you know it's not making an insane amount of power even seven eight hundred horsepower it's perfectly fine if it's on the bottom side of the spec but you still got to check it you don't just torque it and guess because you don't know, like I said, you don't know the quality of the fastener, you don't know the quality of the threads, and there might be something wrong. So you check it with the stretch gauge. So the torque is to set the actual clamp and then you check the stretch to make sure it's actually clamped to the point that you want it, if that makes any sense. Uh, but essentially, the stretch is what provides you the clamping force. It's not the torque. You're torquing it to get a stretch out of the rod bolt. And if you torque it too much, uh, you know it can it can uh, go past the yield point of the fastener, and it just doesn't have that stretch on it, so it's gonna fail. So, yeah, just another thing to keep in mind. So I'm gonna do that real quick and show you guys the stretch after. Uh, so after I torque it to 80 foot pounds, and then we're gonna spin the motor and look at it. Alright guys, so we are right at, if I can get this thing to focus, we're right about uh, 6 thou, so it's 6.2, 6, six and 2 tenths of a thou. That's perfect. They're all within 5.5 to 6.5, and, uh, and that's really what you want. So, 
everything's torqued, everything's stretched. Uh, that's pretty much it. That's how you assemble a 4G63, and that's how you do the critical measurements. Another thing is, uh, remember when I was talking about the side clearance on the rods? So what you want to do is you want to take a feeler gauge and put it over here. I'm not going to show that process because I won't have my feeler gauges until tomorrow. But you check this and you make a note of this. Like I said, too much is a bad thing, too little is a bad thing. So right around anywhere between 6 to 12 thou. Anything more than that or anything less than that, you kind of want to make some adjustments. But yeah, guys, that's pretty much it. So up next, I'll show you guys the engine uh, turned upside down and we're gonna turn it over. Make sure it doesn't bind and there's nothing abnormal. And the end result, guys. Spins like a dream. You guys always wanna turn it over, make sure there's no binding, make sure there's nothing weird going on, no uh, you know, weird tension anywhere, you know, drag, unnecessary drag. One thing I want to point out, guys, is if you don't have good machine work, you're not going to achieve the desired end result, no matter what parts you put in it. So you can buy the best parts money can buy, but if your machine work's not done properly, then you're not going to have the desired end results. So obviously, as you guys know, you guys that have been following me on YouTube, on Instagram, you guys know that we... Uh, torque plate every single block we double check everything when it comes back from the machine shop the big end bores of the connecting rods obviously the piston to wall clearance with the torque plate to make sure there's no uh big you know variation from top to bottom or you know from axes to axes um you know pin clearance all that stuff is very critical um you got to check everything and you know i'm always continuing to better myself i'm always reading I don't know everything, you know, every single day I learn something new. I'm always reading tech articles, Engine Builder magazine, uh, tech magazines, you know, all that stuff because, you know, if I'm bettering myself, then my customer is going to have a better end result, end product, I should say. And you can never know everything. Uh, I always say the day you know everything is the day that you have to put your head down and die because literally every single day you learn something new. But uh, as you guys can see, you know, we use some of the best products on the market. These are custom diamond pistons, vertical, horizontal gas ports, coated skirts. These are the full skirt design. Um, H13 tool steel pins that are, in my opinion, <laughs> unbreakable. Nothing's unbreakable, but this is pretty damn close to that. Some strong connecting rods. You know, making sure the crankshaft's straight, making sure there's no cracks on the crankshaft journals, magnafluxing it, magnaflux, magnafluxing the block. One thing you guys will notice on high power Evos is you can have some cracking from the water jacket to the head stud hole, and that's because of the flex that uh, the engines endure under super high boost and RPM operation. So these blocks are, you know, flexing and, you know, there's chaos going on in the engine when, you know, it's at high RPM, high boost. So, you know, a lot of things that you gotta check for and make sure everything's good before you even start your foundation. So once all that stuff's done, then you can, you know, buy your parts and, um, well, you gotta buy your parts before, but you guys get what I'm trying to say. You guys can assemble it. And, you know, little things that you learn uh, as time goes on, you assemble more engines, little tips and tricks that I try to throw in there. And I forgot a bunch of stuff that I always do and just didn't mention it. But I'll try to do a better video, a more detailed video when it's on my garage in the actual shop. When I have a helping hand, I'm going to do another more detailed video. But uh, please feel free to comment and ask me any questions that you guys may have. You guys uh, know my email. It's on Instagram. Um, and uh, I hope you guys took something away from this and you guys can apply it to, to your build or just for some general knowledge. I hope you guys took something away from this. Uh, I really appreciate you guys watching and I hope you guys have a great day and I'll see you guys next time.